Kirsten Trainer. I'm currently the head of the Institute of Bee Research in Celle, Germany. And I also launched Two Million Blossoms, a quarterly magazine to try and help quell some of this antagonism against honeybees and to get honeybee keepers and native bee enthusiasts to, to sort of talk more to each other and work together. Because for many of the things that are threatening honeybees and native bees, it's the same issues. And we're, we can present a much better united front when we work together. Um, but you're seeing more and more articles such as this piece in The Guardian, where they write, the number of beehives in Britain's city is growing rapidly, putting pressure on native bees that really need our help, say scientists and experienced beekeepers. And so the, the question is really, how can we as beekeepers help counteract some of the information, sometimes some of the misinformation, and to really display a united front of actively working to improve habitat for all pollinators. Next, please. And so this honeybees versus native to bees, it really is um, a false dichotomy and often a false debate. And we are, as beekeepers, we are put there as the villains and the culprits. The truth is that we have changed the habitat drastically as humans. And so the honeybee is not really at fault. It's rather humans and development and the way we've changed our agricultural practices. And so what we really need is more forage for all. Next slide, please. So I'm going to walk you briefly through my, my outline of what I'm going to cover. It's, it's a complicated topic. It's quite thorny at times. And I hope to delve into some of the science. So first, we'll cover insect loss and why it matters. I know I'm preaching to the choir there a little bit. Then we'll go into the value of bees. I'm going to then highlight the current media climate with some headlines from throughout lots of different news sources. Then we'll delve into what the science actually says. And then we'll talk about how beekeepers can be advocates and what the real issue is. Next slide, please. So insect loss and why does it matter? Next slide. We've all heard of the insect apocalypse. It's a complex web of bee decline. Um, there's a paper that came out out of Germany in nature parks, which has shown that our nature reserves, the insect mass within them, has declined by 70 to 80% within the last 30 years. And this has been labeled the insect apocalypse, really a, a widespread loss of our insect diversity due this time, not due to climate change, but predominantly due to Anthropocene, so human changes. Next slide, please. So why should you care? This is a shot of my apiary in Maryland. Um, just when you shoot up into the sky in an apiary, you see a lot of activity. And honeybees are really the most prolific pollinators. They are not the most efficient pollinators on a bee to bee basis, but they are an agricultural unit. They are livestock that we can easily move into our agricultural fields. And so we're highly dependent on them. Next slide, please. Every third bite, as I know, as I said, I'm preaching to the choir, is due to pollinators. Honeybees get the bulk of the credit for this, but there's a lot of other pollinators that are all out there doing work as well. Everything from solitary bees, butterflies, bats in the tropics. A lot of beetles are also accidental pollinators and some of them actively move pollen. Next slide, please. So what is the real value of bees? Next slide, please. Here you see a depiction of the four largest industries. There's the cattle industry that produces the bulk of improved income. Then comes the pork industry. And if you look at the value of pollination, then honeybees are actually the third most agriculturally important livestock. And they're more important than the poultry industry. 75% of all globally important crops depend in some degree on pollination. And the additional yield due to pollination adds about 9% to the global food crop production. This is estimated to be valued at around 216 billion US dollars or about 10% of the total value of the world agricultural food production. Next slide, please. And part of the problem is, of course, that bees interact. 
we have only so many flowering resources and it's resources become harder to find you end up with more interaction and exchange on those same blossoms. Next slide, please. And so the current media climate is really depicting, um, sorry, hitting honeybees against all of these solitary bees. It's become a very loud and vociferous discussion and honeybees are often blamed as pollen pigs, as wiping out an environment of all of its protein content and making life difficult for solitary bees. Next slide, please. So here you see um, an article from the Arizona Sonoran News Service where they write, native bees do it better. People have the best intentions to help pollinators when they start beekeeping, said Schwinn, but some explained how an area can be oversaturated by honeybees that can outcompete native pollinators for natural resources. However, part of the problem is that honeybees, which are native to the UK, they're not native to the United States, they are massive flower, they're attracted to massive flowering crops. They really are generalists, but they seek out massive resources and they can recruit to that with the, um, amongst their nest mates. Most solitary bees are adapted to specialty resources and they will go from flower to flower. They'll often switch between their food sources within the same um, genre of plants and they are really adapted to exploit less utilized resources. Next slide, please. Here's another article from Inside Science, how the bees you know are killing the bees you don't, in which they write, public and policy concern largely revolves around Western honeybees, a domesticated species whose population has actually risen worldwide over the past few decades, despite recent challenges faced by beekeepers. Their success starts, stands in stark contrast to the more than 20,000 other distinct species of bees worldwide, many of which are thought to be declining or facing extinction. And this is true. We, in 2006, 2007, when the news media was full of colony collapse and people started at dinner parties accosting beekeepers because they'd heard all the bees were dying, um, most of the lay public really doesn't understand bee diversity. We have about eight or nine different species of bees that collect honey, the majority of which are native to Asia, whereas Apis mellifera is the European honeybee. And within all um, worldwide, we have about 20,000 species of bees. Many of them are very small, poorly described, and we know very little about them. We have no good baseline data, and so we don't even know if they're really declining and how their populations are shifting because they've been understudied over time. Next slide, please. So here's an article in Wired, which was entitled, You're Worrying, Worrying Around a Sorry, you're worrying about the wrong bees. It's a bit of a tongue twister. And in this, um, they write, save the bees is a common refrain these days. And it's great to see people interested in the little animals critical for our food supply around the globe. But I have one quibble. You're talking about the wrong bees. Next slide, please. Here are two articles that were based on the same FOSS-1 paper. Um, one of them was on the PBS NewsHour, Are Commercial Honeybees Making Wild Bees Sick? And then another one in GRIS, Those Honeybees You're So Worried About, They're Killing Off Wild Bee Species. And so we talk a lot about disease spillover because viruses that we find in honeybees, we are also finding in some wild pollinators. The thing is, just because it exists in two populations doesn't mean that it's being transmitted from one to the other. Often it's also not known to be active. In this case, they were finding deformed wing virus both in honeybees, and then they were finding the active replicating virus in bumblebee colonies in areas where honeybees were kept. But they also didn't do a location comparison. So are the viruses really being transmitted from honeybees or are honeybees and bumblebees in a stressful situation? And it's not a honeybee specific virus, but it's a virus that is common across different species and shared amongst bees. Just because we associate it with honeybees doesn't mean that its only host is a honeybee. Um, or is it really host transfer from honeybees to these other wild bee species? Or are just in agricultural areas where you tend to have a lot of honeybees, are those also more stressful for the wild bees? And they happen to have a shared system of virus. Next slide, please. 
beyond honeybees. Wild bees are also key pollinators and some species are disappearing. This is an article in The Conversation, which is a wonderful news source. It's written typically by scientists about their own research. So this article was written by Kelsey Graham in which she writes, while honeybees are a vital part of our agricultural system, they are generally considered the chickens of the bee world, domesticated and highly managed for specific agricultural use. And this is really what we do have to understand. When we talk about save the bees, are we talking about honeybees that need saving? In which case we really are talking more about saving the beekeepers because honeybees in worldwide, the number of managed colonies is going up. Yes, they are facing a lot more health issues and it's becoming more difficult to keep them alive, but the species as, it, as itself is not in danger of going extinct. Whereas a lot of these solitary bees, they really are having trouble adapting because they are more specialized to specific food sources. And as those food sources disappear, their ranges shift, their populations become isolated, and they then no longer have the genetic diversity for resistance. Next slide, please. And so what does the science actually say? Let's delve a little bit into the recent research that's come out. This has exploded worldwide. There's a lot of scientists trying to address this issue and trying to make sense of it. Next slide, please. So this was a recent review paper called Death by a Thousand Cuts, um, published in PNAS, a really well-respected journal. And one of the things they highlight is that we have very poor historical records. Our records are biased toward important and showy species. So we have really good data, for example, on the rusty patch bumblebee and on the monarch butterfly in the United States, because those are very attractive species. But we have very poor data on the vast majority of insects. Next slide, please. There are 20,000 species of bees worldwide, and part of the problem is they are often difficult to identify. You need entomologists, bee taxonomists, extremely well-trained, working with microscopes. Often you can only tell them apart through genetic analysis or through their genitalia. Um, it's very, very, very difficult to identify things down to species. And so it's very hard to know because a lot of these um, bee species have a, a lot of um, dimorphism in their, in their appearance. Um, and so we, we just have bad baseline data. Next, please. Specialists versus generalists. Honeybees and bumblebees typically are generalists. They have a wide array of diet and they can adapt to whatever we plant. So even though they're not native to the United States, they've adapted to a lot of the food sources we have there. However, if you're a specialist, you have a much more limited range of what you can feed on. Usually you're limited to a, a single genre, so you can, you can feed on multiple species within that genre, but there's a very limited range. And as that food source becomes more um, hard to find or there's bigger patches in between it, then the bees that feed on that specialist food source, they can't migrate between them because they no longer have stepping stones. And so if you have a more limited food source, you tend to suffer a worse fate. Next, please. We've also had intense agricultural, agricultural intensification and deforestation. We're losing land at an unprecedented, unprecedented rate. The USA converted 24 million acres of natural land between 2001 to 2017. Most of that goes into development, expansion of residential areas, expansion of industrial areas, and we're losing a lot of land that used to be wild spaces or at least provide food sources also to agricultural land. Um, we're losing 175 acres of farm and ranch land as well per hour. So what ranch land, uh, sorry, what farmland we do have tends to have fewer food resources for our pollinators and we're just having less farmland overall. Next please. So how do we know that there's actual competition? How do we know what's happening between honeybees and other pollinators? So one of the questions is, is there resource competition? Are honeybees competing for the nectar and pollen in the same area, or are they specialized on different plants? Next, please. Is there a niche overlap? Do managed honeybees and native bees use the same nesting, same plants and nesting places? So for cavity dwelling, of course, then you would have a niche at overlap in nesting habitat. Um, whereas a lot of solitary bees are ground nesting. And so 
honeybees are not con um, competing then for nesting places, but they may be competing for some of the food resources. Next, please. And are there impacts on fitness? And this is really critical. For there be, to be true competition, there needs to be a reduction in fitness. Just because you remove a food source, if that other pollinator still finds enough food so that it can produce the same number of offspring, it's not really suffering any reduction in fitness. And so it's then not true competition. For there to be a true competition, you need to have a reduction in survival, growth, or reproduction. Next, please. And pathogen transmission. Do viruses and parasites become transmitted? Just because we find the same parasite in two species doesn't mean that it's actually causing a problem in that new species. For example, honeybees have nosema. Um, that nosema serrana has also been discovered in bumblebees, but new research has shown that it is, um, it runs through the honeybee gut, but uh, sorry, it doesn't run through the honeybee gut. It runs through the bumblebee gut and that bumblebee excretes it very quickly before it turning into an active infection. So although Nosema serrana is present in bumblebees, it's not causing an active infection. Next, please. So the question really becomes, what are the resources and where are the nectar and pollen dirts? In the early spring, there are few pollinators out and about, but there are also very few resources. And so can we improve habitat so that the, the bees that are out in the times when there may be competition, there's more food resources available. So in early spring, things like crocus, things like willows are very, very critical for both honeybees to raise their first batches of brood and for bumblebee queens who are founding their first nests. Um, bumblebee queens are the only ones who make it through the winter. They have to start up the entire colony on their own. And so when they run into difficulty in the spring due to fluctuating temperatures or lack of food resources, that nest will tend to fail and then they have no chance of founding a colony and producing reproductives that survive into the next year. Next, please. So how do we describe competition? Competition between organisms is an interaction between individuals brought about by a shared requirement for a resource that is in limited supply and leads to a reduction in survivorship, growth, and or reproduction. So you can have a, fee, a, a shared floral resource by honeybees and native bees. However, if there is enough food for the native bees to adapt to others or they, there's enough food to go around, then you're not having true competition. Even if there's new, reduced nutrition, is it tr can that native bee still rear the same number of offspring? Then again, there's no impact. So it's this complicated pathway of interactions that we have to examine. And most of the studies have just looked at presence and absence. Um, they haven't actually done these studies to the next level to see if there's re um, impacts on survivorship, growth, or reproduction. Next, please. Very few of these studies look at reproductive success. And part of the reason is it's very difficult to look at reproductive success of solitary bees. You have to locate their nests, and you have to see what um, the amount of offspring they rear when honeybees are in the area versus when they're not. And then the question is, are those uh, locations identical or are there other factors influencing reproductive success? Is one season, so if you look at long-term studies, how much does a population fluctuate anyway from year to year due to weather conditions? These are very difficult questions to try and untangle. And for the most part, we just lack sufficient data. Next, please. So here's another article that was published in Science in 2018 about conserving honeybees does not help wildlife. When the rallying cry came out to save the bees, a lot of people got into beekeeping and believing they were keeping bees would help the environment. I think beekeeping is a wonderful hobby that is a gateway bug for many individuals to first become aware of ecosystem services. However, if you're trying to save the wild bees, then managing honeybees in your backyard is probably not the best solution, especially if you're going to be hands off. Honeybees are livestock. They need to be treated as livestock and they have appropriate diseases and parasites that need to be managed. Unfortunately, there's a large movement to more and more treatment-free beekeeping, 
so that honeybees can evolve resistance to varroa. The problem with that is we do not live in a natural density of bees, of honeybee colonies. In the wild, you have one colony per square kilometer. And so when that colony dies off from too much parasite pressure, it's not within easy flying range for robbers and other bees to come and bring those diseases and parasites home. We do not keep bees in isolation. And so we have to recognize that principles that work in isolated areas where there are no other beekeepers around and our honeybees can evolve resistance to varroa, um, we don't have those same environments. We have a constant influx of new hosts. And so through robbing and through the slow collapse of colonies, those bees will drift and take their problems into neighboring hives. And so we have to realize what we're dealing with and address it appropriately. Next slide, please. So Apis mellifera really are critical livestock. We need them in our agricultural system. They are, however, livestock, and they need to be managed appropriately so that our diseases do not transfer to other apiaries around. Um, even Tom Seeley, who, who advocates for Darwinian beekeeping, he will still tell beekeepers that you have to monitor your mite levels. And if your mite levels are about above 10 per 100 bees, then you have to eliminate that colony from the population because otherwise it will crash and those varroa mites will be picked up by other colonies in the vicinity, creating an unnatural pressure to which there is no ability of a colony to evolve, evolve resistance. Varroa mites have a much rap, more rapid reproduction rate than honeybees. A varroa mite has a reproductive um, cycle every 12 days in worker brood and every 15 days in drone brood, since that is the capped reproductive stage and they reproduce in the capped brood. So within a single beekeeping season, varroa mites have the opportunity to reproduce anywhere from 12 to 20 times. This gives them an ecological and evolutionary advantage because they have so many reproductive cycles. It's why they evolve resistance so quickly to our varroa sides. And while our honeybee queens are very fecund and can produce up to their own body weight in, in worker offspring every day during the early spring and summer, um, that is not reproduction of a honeybee colony. A honeybee colony naturally only reproduces by swarming or when we make a split and a new queen. Next slide, please. So how do we measure? The extent of competitive effects depend on many factors. It depends on overall resource availability, the degree of niche overlap between managed and wild bee species, and the densities of both managed and wild bees. And so there's a lot of interacting factors that we need to take into account. And the real issue is that we just do not have enough forage. Um, we used to have a lot more managed colonies in the United States. We used to have about five to six million in the 1940s and 50s. And at the same time, we had huge abundances of wild pollinators. The problem is we've changed our landscape. So the problem is not that the honeybees are causing difficulties for the wild bees, but that we as humans have changed the landscape so much that all bees are running into problems finding enough food. Next slide, please. So we really know too little about most wild species. What we need desperately are better baseline data on populations. As I said before, most of the data we have is biased towards cute, showy species. Um, and we really just don't know. It's also biased to specific locations where entomologists have been very active in surveying. We do not have nationally wide or even worldwide good baseline data to know what did we have before, what do we have now, and how much loss is there? How well are they adapting? Germany, for example, is actually picking up new bee species. It used to have around 560 different species of bees. We're now up to about 585. And that is because bees that used to be only found in more southern climates are migrating north into Germany because the weather is becoming warmer and they can now survive there. Um, we also have annual swings in population growth due to shifting weather, rainfall, and temperature. So just because you have a low population one year doesn't mean that that population is crashing. Sometimes it's something else is tied up with that population cycle and they can rebound. We need better data on what these natural fluctuations are so that we can understand the trends over time. We're certainly having an insect decline, but the question is very hard to piece out. Some insects are expanding rapidly. 
um, and, and adapting well. And those are usually the nuisance insects that nobody wants. Also, we need better knowledge of the fitness cost of nutritional stress. So what happens when a spring is really cold and wet like it was this year? What impact does that have, not just on the generation reared that year, but the following year? So there's more and more studies showing that when you have very wet um, falls, then you end up with higher populations the next year. So there's these interactions that we need long-term data on to better understand. We also need to know more about the diet requirements for successful reproduction. How does changing lipid profiles or changing resources change the amount of offspring an individual can rear? And we need to know more about preferred nest habitat. There are some species of bees we have never, we have never discovered a nest for. We know very little about what their preferences are. And we also have to change our own personal perspective of what is an, a healthy habitat, right? As humans, we have a huge tendency of cleaning everything up and organizing everything and turning large wild landscapes into perfect immaculate lawns as, as a status symbol. However, those cleanup efforts and our weed-free desire for the perfect green lawn, those create food deserts. And so we as, as humans who own quite a lot of property, if we can make our environments more friendly and more nutritious, then we can make a big stepping stone to interconnected habitats for wild pollinators. Next, please. So there's um, this lovely review that came out in 2017. They looked at 146 different studies um, that looked at competition between honeybees and native bees. And there are three mechanisms by which managed bees can affect wild bees. There's competition. They can also create changes in plant community composition because if you have a lot of honeybees in an area, they will fly to things that produce a lot of nectar or pollen that are very nectar rich and cause more seed production there. And so you can have over time shift in, um, in the plant communities based on what's being poll uh, pollinated. And then there's also examples of pathogen, pathogen transmission. Managed bees have the potential to negatively affect wild bees, they write in this review, but they also say that most of these studies did not measure wild bee fitness, population, or community level responses. They lacked reproductive rates, they lacked information on survival, abundance, and diversity. And some studies even found positive effects of managed bees on native plant communities. There are places where we're doing restoration efforts where people will actually, who are putting a lot of money into these seed banks to try and restore native meadows, will ask beekeepers to be in the area to provide pollination so that those expensive seeds they've put in the ground have an opportunity to be pollinated and reproduce and help reestablish um, the wildflowers that we need. Next, please. So um, I think one of the th key things is that beekeepers need to act as advocates. We are large, um, diverse group of individuals who manage anywhere from one or two hives to sometimes several hundred or sometimes several thousand. We want the best for our bees, but we need to be aware that honeybees do interact with wild bees. And there are some areas that perhaps should not be um, migrated to en masse by commercial beekeepers or large amount of hives if there are not enough resources there or if there are endangered pollinators in those areas. Next, please. Um, there's a quote from Marla Spivak that was in NPR that I quite love. Uh, it's about how honeybees are a gateway bug and it says, we're all on a learning curve. We're on a learning curve, all of us. It's like honeybees were the portal and the door to much larger issues, conservation issues in general. Next. Concern for honeybees help more people understand why it's important to have more land covered with wildflowers and trees and free from pesticides. Such a landscape is good for both honeybees and wild bees. And this is really what I'm trying to address. We as honeybee keepers, are very much more aware of ecosystem services and what impacts the health, not just of our honeybees, but wild pollinators as well. And so we can be some of the most avid voices um, for political change and for changes in policies. For example, what is permitted in our backyards and homeowners associations? How can we work together so that the pathways along city roads or in parks provide not just something that's easy to care for, but that is nutritionally rich for passing pollinators. Next, please. 
And so um, there's this excellent article that was published in 2020 called The Gordian Knot, which really addresses how beekeepers are fundamental in raising awareness about pollinators and plant pollination. Beekeepers as a whole tend to promote environmental stewardship and they have engaged in conversations, dinner conversations, as we all know when we're invited to a party and somebody learns we're a beekeeper, they wanna know more about what we're up to. And that has led to a change in our lawn care aesthetics. Um, through conversations with our neighbors and making them aware that the choices they make in their own front and backyard have an impact on the wildlife, we, did, we slowly change what is acceptable. And so now there's a movement away from pure immaculate lawns back more towards the cottage garden look that's wilder and, and there's more tolerance for some things that may look a little unkept. There's a general movement to mow the lawn less often, which most homeowners are happy to do because it saves money on fuel, it saves them time. And if you mow every other week instead of every week, then the plants that are already in that habitat will have a chance to bloom and provide food. Um, beekeepers are also um, very politically active and help lead to changes in environmental regulations. And they help individuals become more aware of the issues impacting the health of all pollinators. Next, please. And so I just wanna advocate that if we're planting for bees, um, we as beekeepers, our, our bees like to visit um, massive nectar sources. And so what we put in our yard for the most part is ignored by our honeybees. Um, when I lived in Maryland, I put in a seven acre wildflower meadow. I had 20 colonies in my backyard. At that time, it was a large farm property. And I put it in for my honeybees. Of course, as soon as it started to bloom, I was out there walking the fields every day and my honeybees completely ignored it because there were other resources, trees, for example, that were um, blooming readily that they found more attractive. But once I planted this meadow, I was incredibly surprised to see the diversity of bumblebees and native pollinators and butterflies that started showing up. I started having monarchs that were mating in my backyard. I started having relatively rare bumblebees that I had never seen before foraging in the field. So when we plant it, they will come, but we need to advocate very strongly for more planting. Next, please. Um, this is just to depict what you see here from left to right is 1945 all the way up until about 2006, 2007 when colony collapse disorder occurred in the United States. And this is the number of managed honeybees in the United States. As you can see on the left hand side of the graph, the dots um, are, are up between five and six million. That is how many managed colonies we had in the United States in the 1940s until about the 1960s. You can see there's quite a little rapid drop off in the 1980s when varroa mites arrived. Um, and then there's a gap in information because the USDA changed how it collects information. However, since the, about the 1990, late 1990s into the mid 2000s, we've been at about 2.4 to 2.8 million managed colonies. Next, please. Um, between 1990 and 2020, the US Fish and Wildlife Service estimated that North America may have lost about a billion butterflies. And this has been most dramatically depicted by the loss in monarch butterflies for which we have huge amounts of citizen science data that's been collected since the 1970s to try and understand their migratory route and the population of butterflies. And, and monarch butterflies, especially the Western monarch population has done a nosedive. Um, the, this is in large part due to habitat fragmentation climate change and the loss of milkweed a very important food source for their caterpillars. Next, please. Since the late 1990s, the rusty patch bumblebee abundance has declined by about 87%. Um, it's shrunk in its, its range where you can find it and colonies are just being found less and less often. And when you see these concomitant declines in the number of honeybees and butterflies and other species of bees, that seems to indicate that it's not the honeybees causing the problems for these pollinators, but something else is the issue. And the real issue is lack of food resources and a much more unpredictable environment for all. Next, please. And so what is the real issue? Um, there's competition for food sources. As you can see here on this, 
lovely little fig that is being visited by bumblebees, wasps, and flies. Everybody is out there hungry, looking for food. Next, please. The real issue is poor nutrition for all. We used to have very flower-rich meadows, and then with the invent, advent of synthetic fertilizers, um, the resource-poor meadows that used to be very, very flower-rich and um, were turned into cropland and, and pasture. And in that nitrogen-rich environment that we can now create as farmers and as agricultural users, those wildflowers disappear. They can't then compete with the grasses. And so places that used to bloom beautifully, like you see in this photo, are being eradicated and we no longer have the flower diversity that we once had. Next, please. So the question is, are we facing a straw man, man argument? Are honeybees really to blame? Or are they just an easy target to pick on because they use the same resources? Honeybees are native to Europe. Um, so it's not even that they're an invasive species in, in, Western, in Western Europe or the UK. They've been there um, longer than, than humans have been there. Um, agriculture, and we depend on our agriculture, our agriculture depends on them. Uh, we, we have unfortunately inappropriately shifted the habitat that they depend on, not just honeybees, but our native bees as well. It's becoming harder and harder to find areas both for beekeepers um, to find nutrition as well as areas where wild bees can thrive and survive. We've had massive globalization which introduces species from one area into another and just as when the settlers arrived in the United States before, um, in North America they brought unknown diseases with them for which the native populations had no defenses and that's also what's occurring. So we have a big trade in bumblebees, bumblebee species that have been brought to other areas, bring with them illnesses that are, 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 can jump between bumblebee species and tend to wipe out or have negative impacts on some, some species that aren't used to dealing with those diseases. So massive globalization has made things more difficult for everything because we're just moving pests and parasites around. So where pests and parasites used to only be in a specific region, we as humans ship things everywhere and they now spread very rapidly. Varroa is a perfect example of that. It has made it everywhere except for some islands in Australia. And Australia is already in defensive mode, ready for it to arrive on their shores as it has in New Zealand. We also have rapidly shifting weather patterns. So in the past, we used to have a much more stable and cold winter. A cold winter is very important for a lot of insects. It, it also eliminates a lot of um, vector-borne diseases. And with warmer weather patterns, things end up being more problematic. You end up not having true brood breaks, for example, in honeybees. And so varroa mites can keep reproducing and your virus um, population then kept in those varroa mites accompanies the colony throughout the winter as well. As well as rapidly shifting weather makes, for very unstable springs. For example, this year we had a very long, very cold and very wet spring that made it very, very difficult for pollinators to be out foraging. Things were blooming and the only things flying tended to be bumblebees because they're built for cold weather. They're big, they can generate a lot of heat, um, but sometimes they would go out and then become, get cooled off and not be able to make it home to their nest. The rapidly shifting weather patterns make it very, very difficult for our pollinators to adapt and get to their food resources. Next, please. So how can we help protect our environment? Um, we as individuals can advocate for changes. An increase in cover crops that are actually allowed to bloom is an excellent way to provide food for all pollinators. We need to help fill these nectar dirts that didn't used to exist. So late summer is a perfect example. There's very, very little blooming after the lime trees um, stop, stop providing nectar. And yet there's a lot of pollinators that only come, become active in, in June into July. And there are very limited food resources then for them available. We need to, as a, as a world population, increase our organic production and move away from our, our um, pesticide treadmill that unfortunately many growers have become dependent on because of the size and scale of their operations and um, production costs as well. 
We need to develop more smart ag spot treatments so that instead of spraying entire fields, we use high tech technology such as drone footage to understand where pest problems are appearing and then just spot treat in those areas. Um, helping to reduce the amount of chemicals we're putting out into the environment. In our managed pollinators, we need to select for disease resistance. There's ongoing efforts for this, um, but this needs to be a priority amongst managed pollinators, not just in honeybees, but in the commercial osmia and bumblebee populations as well. As beekeepers, we need to be better about our varroa control to help reduce spillover because varroa mites are vectors of multiple viruses. And as beekeepers, we need to actively engage with our neighbors to promote pollinator habitat. We can't just be asking for things for honeybees without presenting a united front that we really need forage and better environmental conditions for all, um, for all pollinators. And as beekeepers, we're lucky. We can manage food resources for our colonies. We can provide insurance against erratic weather by providing extra food in the late summer, early fall, to provide a buffer for those very in unpredictable springs where often in February, it's quite warm, colonies start brooding up. And once they start brood rearing, they usually don't stop. And once they pick up with their brood rearing, that's when they really start to tear through their honey stores because now they need to keep that colony at body temperature in effect to, to make sure that brood survives. When there's no brood in the colony, the temperature is quite, quite a bit cooler. Um, in that hive, they don't need it as warm. It can drop down to about 25 degrees Celsius, whereas when there's brood, they need it at 32 to 34. And so it's with the days growing longer in January and in late January, early February, when they start rearing brood, that they crank up the temperature and really go through their food stores. And so as beekeepers managing agricultural livestock, we need to make sure they have enough food resources to make it through unpredictable weather events. Next, please. Um, and I highly recommend that as beekeepers, we become bee distracted, that we take the time to learn more about the other pollinators in our habitats, in our gardens, um, and become advocates for this diversity. Here you can see a wonderful sweat bee by Rachel Bonoan, um, who's now a scientist in Rhode Island. Uh, she's worked with both honeybees and butterflies and is, has a beautiful um, photographic background. Next, please. We can also, although bee hotels can be problematic, um, they're wonderful for raising awareness. As, as the, our neighbors put these up, they become aware of the traffic and they start changing their own planting environment. So although most bee hotels are poorly constructed and you can make your one yourself much better, you have to make sure that the holes you drill are smooth enough so that your um, bees are not injured coming and going and you need to make sure that you clean them out every year so that they don't end up with, with disease. Um, the best way of cleaning them is by flaming them, but it raises awareness. So even if they sometimes attract parasites and um, they're not ideal, they at least make people aware that bees require habitat. The best thing, of course, that we can do is leave dead trees, um, not clean up all our branches and really do our spring cleanup in, sorry, our garden cleanup in the spring instead of in the winter, because there's a lot of things living in that leaf litter. Next, please. Um, there are lots of great projects going on. One in the United States is Pollinator Pathways, where homeowners are trying to interconnect habitat to create stepping stones so that populations do not become isolated. Next, please. And um, this is from my magazine, Two Million Blossoms. This is uh, Sarah Red Laird who was asked by the Department of Transportation in Oregon, who was doing a massive restoration project, putting in a lot of native plants um, and asked her as a beekeeper to show up so that there would be pollination. She's been working with them now for five years and she's regularly doing surveys there to see the interactions between wild bees and her honeybees to see what food resources really do work and attract things and what native and invasive plants may be providing really important nutrition. Next, please. So I, I just want to emphasize that honeybees, although we as beekeepers sometimes have trouble keeping them alive, they're very, very resilient pollinators. They live in large colonies. They have a buffer workforce. They can lose 5 to 10% of their population, and the colony can still survive. Next, please. The other pollinators, they often go it alone. And so they really need a lot more support. 
And so I think as beekeepers, we can be incredibly active voices to get an improvement in habitat for all. Next, please. And so that's really the end. I hope you enjoyed the talk. I know it was a bit of a whirlwind and I'm happy to take any questions. One of the things you mentioned was that in the wild, you have one colony per square kilometer. Right? Um, my question is, what kind of habitat were you referring to when you said one colony per square kilometer? So that's the data from Tom Seeley in the Arno forest. And honeybees are traditionally forest dwelling, um, a, a forest dwelling species. They live on the edge of the forest. And so if, if you're looking at the natural density for varroa mites, it was one colony per square kilometer. And when he's gone back to survey now and he finds feral colonies that are surviving, it is again about one colony per square kilometer. So that seems to be the natural density that most habitat supports in the wild and, and where you don't have issues with parasite transfer between colonies. I also sat in on a lecture by a, a, a German presenter yesterday who was telling me that beekeepers are the problem and every time um, bees get moved into a, an area they will soak up the nectar and stop the other pollinators from feeding largely. And of course we're the problem because we then go and soak up the honey. Um, I'm hearing from you that the... Um, the problem is that we don't have enough pollination areas because we've been destroying them. I'm sure between the two ends of this academic discussion, there is a medium. I'm, median. I'm just wondering if you have any sense of where it might ultimately be to give us a way forward. Thank you for the question. So honeybees do, as a resource, use a lot of pollen. However, we, we also have to be aware that honeybees are also designed to exploit massive resources. So things like our linden trees, our acacia trees, um, our willow trees. A lot of other pollinators are have a much more limited niche and have adapted to use resources that honeybees are actually not using. Um, and so it, it's a more nuanced conversation. I know it's often presented as very black and white as honeybees are the issue, but we really need to look also exactly what our native bees need. And often it's not these massive sources that the honeybees go and exploit, like lucerne and uh, clover. Rather, they, need, they, they go after the things that tend to be avoided by honeybees. Um, and so th there's, there's niche adaptation and resource allocation. Even in some commercial crop areas when they've had honeybees and other pollinators there, they find that even within a given tree, the honeybees exploit one area of the tree and the native bees tend to exploit other edges of the trees. And so there may be less competition than we actually think, but we, we lack the fine detail on it. We, we need more studies. I would only follow that up by saying I observe exactly that in my garden where my, my seven hives, um, the bees take off from that and they zoom off elsewhere where I was in... Uh, in March and April, I have great fun watching the uh, the hairy hairy leg flower bee. Uh, love my lunar my um, pul pulmonaria, uh, and the honeybees hardly ever touch that. Um, so yes, there's the local version of what I've just heard you say. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. I I have one question for you, Kirsten. If you were going to plant one tree in your garden for wild wild bees and one plant one flower in your garden, which would they be? Um, in the United States, it would be a, a willow for an early pollen resource and goldenrod for a late nectar source and pollen source. Um, I can't advocate goldenrod in the UK, so it'd have to be, it, it would have to be asters. So, um, there, there are, I mean, goldenrod, there's 130 different species in the United States. There's actually 15 different solitary bees that depend on goldenrod pollen in the United States. And there are a lot of varieties that are not spreading in the same meadow invasive type way that unfortunately Canadian goldenrod does. Um, with, with, with the pressure on, um, uh, on the forage, is it likely that the um, bees would normally go for those with a higher um, uh, nutritional value so the the more that's taken um, the what what is left is of, is is of a lower nutritional value and that might cause 
health problems with um, either native bees or, um, uh, or managed bees? I honestly don't have enough knowledge to... Um, presumably, um, the, the, the best food sources get taken first. Those with the highest nutritional value. I would, I would argue that what people perceive as best or what species perceive as best differs between species. So, for example, the monarch butterfly caterpillar is, is designed to, to live on milkweed, which is toxic to most other insects. Um, so there's, there's specialization, and the same happens with, with other pollinators. Cer certain food sources that are toxic to other, other pollinators, some pollinators have evolved to exploit just that resource. And so they're not actually in direct competition with each other. So we, we need to define better which specific pollinators we're talking about. Honeybees are designed to find large resources which they can exploit en masse. So they're, they're going after things like clover, like rape, like our linden trees, like our what we call basswood, um, our acacia trees. A lot of other pollinators prefer other resources. Um, they, they, you'll, you'll find certain things that are foraged on by all. Russian sage is an excellent example. You'll find bumblebees and solitary bees and honeybees on Russian sage. Um, it has lots of small florets, but it, it really depends on the specific plant. And, and many, many honeybees apparently are actually quite good at self-medicating. So when they're lacking salt, they will forage for salt waters. This changes throughout the season. Um, and so they'll find different resources to, to pick up the missing salts that they have. There, there's more and more information coming out that they do similar things with pollen. So when they're lacking certain amino acids, they will go forage on different resources.